What's up, Faithful? Welcome to this Monday night edition of the 49er Faithful UK Live. As always, I'm your host, Paul Hope, and tonight I'm being joined by not one, but two returning guests to help me break down all things 49ers. My first guest, I would say, needs no introduction, especially if you're a fan of our podcast. He is one of the awesome foursome, and I'll say it again, this man has the hardest job in sports entertainment. That's right, he has to keep me. Lee and Naji Kara under check at least twice a week in the regular season. And that is no mean feat, I can tell you. Member of the admin team, all round good guy. It is the one, the only, Gareth Ellis. Good evening, Paul. Thank you for that kind of introduction. Unnecessary. You're, <laughs> You're not that difficult, but uh, I, I do enjoy being on the other side and, uh, and being unruly um, and not having to keep an eye on the clock. So, yeah, good to be here. Good evening, Faithful. No, or I good, mean you, good lunchtime if you were if you're somewhere else. You've set the bar with the introductions on the podcast. So since I've taken over the big chair on the live, you know, it has to be done. Now, coming back, Gareth, he must be a glutton for punishment because yeah. second week in a yeah. row, it's everybody's favourite international jet setter and the group flag bearer, Eric Oregard, is in the house. Good hey. evening, Paul. Good evening, Gareth. Good hey. evening, Eric. Absolute pleasure to be back on. I'm glad I didn't uh, put you all off last week. I had a lot of fun, a lot of uh, nice feedback. And uh, yeah, it's really good to be on. So I'm really happy to be back. And obviously, really happy to be talking about the 49ers, all things 49ers. We love it. So James, he's put, what blasphemy is this? A Monday instead of a Wednesday, the next thing we'll be expecting, the Spanish Inquisition. Well, James, we just like to keep you guessing. It is officially the off-season, and unfortunately, we have this thing called life, work, families, and other commitments. Oh. So what we've decided to do between now and the draft starting, you'll either get a live or you'll get a pod. And we wanted to mix things up. As Gareth said at the start, everybody, he doesn't want to host every week. He wants to come on, be unruly, and be yeah. a guest. So, <laughs> And Alex Simpson does agree with me. You do have the hardest job, Gareth. So... <laughs> Let's have a little look. Red Jet Shell is in the house. Blessings from USA, California. She's beat me to it. Like and subscribe. Davis <laughs> McNiner checking in from across the pond. Colin is in the house. Appreciate the love, Colin. Brian Cole. Now, chaps, I worked out that today is exactly one month until this year's NFL draft. So I thought tonight we would touch upon the roster breaking news and kind of our thoughts. Now, before I hand over to Eric, he gave me his thoughts on free agency last week, Gareth. How are you feeling now we've settled down after the initial two weeks of free agency? What are your thoughts on what we've done so far, buddy? Yeah, good business, I think. A uh, little bit under the radar. Um, but obviously, with, uh, with the quality of the team that we've got, we didn't necessarily need to make the splash signings. I think the re restocking of the defensive line, we talked about that being underwhelming and, and we needed to uh, have a have another go and and reload on the defensive line which we we've done so and we've done quickly and I'm, I'm quite excited to see the players we've got there uh big shame i think to to lose eric armstead but it's getting to that point where yeah your age and your injury history um i don't think necessarily his performance dropped off but that kind of that overall value suddenly starts dipping below what you're actually being paid or more to the point what you're actually sucking up out of the salary cap um and i do think it was probably it's tough but it is a it is a nasty nasty part of the business at this time of year um and unfortunately i think that's it's probably not a bad decision um but good to see he's he's been picked up elsewhere um he's going to carry on his career and wish him all the best but i do think that was that was good um probably good business sadly hate to say it like that um, hate to see the guy go, but there we go. Um, and some interesting sort of more fringe sign-ups. Uh, the, the the ex Saints cornerback, uh, cornerback Yerdom, Yerdom. We'll we'll find out how to say it before the new season. I'm I sure. Would. 
<laughs> so that's 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 interesting. And I think um, the smattering of players, obviously a lot on the defensive side, and maybe we'll get on to, can we see what uh, John is thinking about when we come to the draft um, based on, on where we've targeted free agency. But I think tidy business, and I think we've gone out and we've targeted areas and, and we've done what we needed to do, and I'm excited. Me and Eric had our thoughts on free agency last week. So before we dive into the draft talk, I want to kind of get your thoughts, Eric, because as I said at the start, we kind of slowed down on the pod and it's always a bit strange because I go all season talking to you, Nadji and Lee, probably more than my own family. Suddenly I have this weird uh, vacuum for a couple of weeks. Now before I get Eric's thought and draft talk, Brandon, are you, George Kittle? I don't know if you two saw our flag has garnered a lot of attention in the last six months or so. And I love the fact that we've kind of seen our flag being flown by many a content creator. Now, well documented, I'm not an English football fan. So my first thought was when the international jerseys were released, it was £125 for a soccer jersey. Are you kidding me? But then the fallout of Flaggate. So I created a little banner. And I thought, what better than a Swede, a Welshman and an Englishman to just have a daft five minutes? I want your thoughts. Do you think we've got something to worry about with the flag? El President, they need to be checking that trademark. Or do you think it's just absolute nonsense, Jack? I'll go with Eric first. Yeah, Eric. go on, Eric. Go on, Eric. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I, you yeah, can take that one. It's a nonsense, isn't it? Gareth, you did say we were going to be unruly, so we're allowed to call it a nonsense. The whole flag controversy. And also... You know me, Paul. I like the flag more than most. I've taken it to many a country. Um, we have a picture with my famous flag outside the Golden Gate Bridge, etc. I took it all around Southeast Asia and Australia. So it's it's got to stay. It's, it's world famous now. It's been all around. Um, we've had people take it paragliding. Shout out Wayne Humphrey. Mm. Um, we've had people take it all over Europe. Um, lots of people in the group. So now it's... Um, it's become synonymous with the group, isn't it? And uh, I, when I see it, it just uh, reminds me of the group. So, yeah, it makes me happy. I, I'm a huge fan and it has to stay red and gold, doesn't it? What do you think, Gareth? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's eye-catching. Obviously, everybody knows the uh, the Union flag um, and its uh, sort of arrangement, if you like, the, the, the triangles and the lines. Um, it's a very strong image. Um, and we've just, I think, it's it's just where we put that little uh, Niners twist on it. Um, and a lot of people, I think, are getting a little bit overexcited. Um, but, we you know, some people out there seem to like finding things to get a little bit overexcited about. Um, so, yeah, I I don't think we've ever had any problem with this before. Um, do, do you I don't think, think we've had a problem um, past. Do, do you think that the England team were taking a leaf out of the 49er faithful UK's book? by changing up a flag just to try and be a bit relevant. Do you think we've taken the lead and they're just following? Maybe. I mean, as, as Gareth said, we've not had any kind of heat for this. Um, quiet weekend, social media-wise. So I put a couple of tweets out there, a couple of cheeky posts, because our flag is well-received. Like you said, Eric, me and you had our photo outside the Golden Gate Bridge. I took it on holiday to Mallorca and Tenerife last year. Um, when we were down in London, for the uh, watch party in October. A few San Francisco locals who were holidaying in London saw me at London Bridge, with well, Tower Bridge, with the flag, and they were like straight over 49ers, 49ers fans. So seeing the stuff at the weekend, and I was thinking, I know it could kind of, you're messing with national flags, but we've kind of taken the Union Jack. And I said to Gareth Hoffer, it's a compliment for me that we've taken the national flag We've mixed it with the Niners colours and it's kind of bringing together two things that we all love. And it's just a symbol of our group. You know, Larry Kruger flies it. John Chapman flies it. Uh, Brian Culp has asked for one. I think Lee, if he was on, would be able to say there's hundreds of flags being ordered. So I'd be a bit gutted if we had to stop using them now. But I just thought we'd touch upon it because it is relevant. It did happen at the weekend and I just wanted yeah. your thoughts on Flaggate. And as James has put there, he infiltrated enemy territory and stood boldly outside Lumen Stadium with the flag. And I think even James said, chaps, he was well received in Seattle flying that flag. So I think it's here to stay anyway. 
Sure. Yeah, totally. And I think haven't we seen a, a a black and gold Saints one? I think somewhere at some point. Um, yeah. I'm sure one of those got uh, shared around the group, and I'm sure I'm sure there's a green and yellow Green Bay Packers one somewhere around. It's it's hardly you know I hate to break it to anyone in the in the UK faithful. It's hardly that original, you know, mm. taking one flag's colours and and slightly mixing them with a with another subject. So I it's think been done we, before. I think if we'd kept it as the Union Jack colours and put the Niners logo on, I think our colour scheme wouldn't fit the Niners colour scheme. Mm. And, and like you said, Gareth, I've seen, I think the Vikings have got one. I've seen the Ravens fans group. It's not an original idea. It's just, I think given how our community's grown, and it leads me on to something Eric mentioned before we went live, the international marketing rights, all aware that the UK have a 49ers market. But didn't you say there was a tweet or a post today, Eric, about the fact that that's expanding? Yeah, I think there was just some updated countries. I don't know if it was 49ers specifically, but uh, all, the, all the teams were listed in the various markets and 49ers looked to be focusing on the UK, which is nice. And also Mexico obviously had the game there. Um, so it seems to be that those are the markets. Obviously, there's a big um, Mexican population in California um, and people of Mexican heritage. So that makes, makes total sense, makes a lot of sense. And we're super happy that... Um, that they're focusing on the UK and obviously we're part of that mission. I think we all want the the team to expand their target audience in the UK and want more people to join the group and keep it growing because it's grown a lot over the last few years and it's just going from strength to strength. So let's hope that continues. So from what I've saw earlier today, chaps, I believe the Niners still need to add about 20 players to get our off-season roster up to 90. Much of the work will be done during this next month, segueing into the NFL Draft Talk. Now, Smooth. I did send you chaps a breakdown of what we believe the roster may look like at the moment. Now, filling 20 players to the 90-man roster, I don't think we've got that many spaces on the 53, given those pictures that I sent you chaps. Now, while we dive into it, for the people watching at home, I want you to grade our free agency so far. So in the chat, just drop an A to F. A, obviously, B, you're happy, you've done very well. F, you're not very happy. And I'll just, we'll, we'll garner what the UK faithful feels free agency went. Now, me and Eric touched upon the quarterback room last week, Gareth. Now, I naively assumed that that was set. There was no quarterback controversy. And I tweeted a picture out of the three quarterbacks. And straight away, people on Twitter were like, well, Allen's QB2, Dobbs is QB3. And I was like, hang on a minute. I thought it would be Purdy, Dobbs, mm-hmm. Allen. Where do you stand on that, Gareth? Putting you on the spot, which is what we do on the Fighting Hannah Faithful UK Live. Well, Dobbs, Dobbs obviously got some uh, games games under his belt um, last season. Um, but up and down. I think it was very much... Uh, People loved the fairy story for a bit, and then it came came crashing down. Um, he's a bit of fun, I think. Um, I wouldn't want to rely on him for more than a more than a few games. Um, but there's there's always seems to be the, the there's plenty of backup quarterbacks, and there's, there's plenty of them around for a reason. Um, and that's all these quarterbacks that get drafted or go undrafted, and then they can bounce around the league for a while. Um, I think your guy, he's He's a guy that Shanahan clearly has seen something in him or or um, greasy as. And we've gone out and, and picked him up. Um, obviously, we've saved a little bit off the cap by letting Darnold go. Uh, I think it's the sort of thing a player would love to come and have a year in Shanahan's system. I think that's you can see Darnold's just gone and doubled his salary for playing one garbage time game at the end of the season that he lost. Um, and and being with Shanahan for a season has as as earned him four million dollars, um, basically regardless of how it pans out for him at the Vikings. So uh, it good. He seems seems like a um, you know level headed guy to have around the locker room, um, and maybe there is a genuine competition there for the QB two spot, which I think is always good. You know, there ain't a competition for the QB one spot. Let's just put that to bed, shall we? Um, but yeah, I uh, I don't see it. I, I'm. He's not a guy I'm hugely going to rely on if he has to come in and carry us for four, five, six games. 
uh, because he's a backup quarterback. There's very few teams that do have a backup quarterback you can rely on. So uh, we needed we need another body, um, and I do think we might dip in for a, a late draft pick and um, go back to see see if there's another Purdy somewhere. But Eric, yeah, have you no, seen no, mind, I, Eric? No, no, I'm still with you. I think Dobbs is number two, and what I do think is he's got a lot of potential. He's got a ceiling that's a little bit higher than what Donald's is. I would say. Um, mm. he's obviously good, That's a bit bold. more athletic. I think he's got a higher ceiling than Darnold. And obviously Darnold, I don't think has fulfilled his ceiling. Might be bold. And we obviously also know that Dobbs is better than Kyler Murray. So all is good, right? <laughs> I like that. Well, mm. we, we're, we're going to look at the roster. Now you mentioned it, Gareth. Darnold's gone for 10 mil to the Vikings. Our QB room is going to be 5 mil for all three. So when you look at it, isn't it? It's counting absurd. the pennies and, you know, we're going to touch upon Brandon Ayuk later, people. Don't worry. But you're, you're right, Gareth. And it's kind of, I talk to, I've got a couple of colleagues at work who don't like the NFL. And they keep talking to me about converting me back to watching the Premier League. And I keep saying it's boring. And then trying to explain the salary cap to them. That's the one thing that they agree on. They wish the salary cap was in other sports because it seems quite an intriguing way to run your franchise and the fact that Donald got 10 mil there was no I didn't want to bring him back on his current salary Gareth let alone doubling his salary so it's it, it is a it's a valuable position it's one of those positions you've got to get right in the way you value it because if you don't value it enough y- y- your season can come unstuck pretty pretty quickly how many was it last season we had 68 quarterbacks starting games or something like that it's absurd Almost every single team was using its its backup quarterback at some point in the season, yeah. um, and particularly now with with quite rightly the concussion protocols coming in, you know any quarterback can miss any game, literally. Just I mean it might just be with that one game, but because of that, suddenly you fail a concussion check and you and you can't clear it by by the point in midweek, you're sitting out, and suddenly we're going to Seattle with Josh Dobbs. Um, for uh, quarterback, um, and it happens, and that's the difference between number one overall pick, and and being, you know, the fifth or sixth, um, and having to suddenly go on the road. So we know uh, number one seed, not number one pick. Nah, we knew what you meant. I was thinking well, trade already, uh, draft already. <laughs> well, <laughs> last week Eric put me on the spot a little bit because we went into the running back slash fullback room. Now, obviously. The- the four names Eric was able to bring to the table last week, McCaffrey, Mitchell, Mason, Jack. They got me thinking, we're not going into this season with just them four. So draft talk, running backs and all the rest of it. I personally believe we're going to add two back to this collection. I think we might see one go into the roster, one stashed on the practice squad. Do you agree or disagree with my thought process at the moment? I'll go to Gareth first and see what Gareth thinks. Well, we've got a bit of a spotted history, haven't we, with the with the running backs that the guys we pick up undrafted turn out to be good, and the guys we we sink third round picks in um, barely get a carry, uh, which is it's it's a strange it's just a strange way. I think it, it's there's no reason to it. It's it's the draft. It's it's a crapshoot a lot of the time. You can you can pick what you think. Um, we had picked two quarterback, two running backs, and it was Elijah Mitchell. Who had the good season um, and not um, the third round pick whose name completely escapes me at the moment from a few years back. Oh, I don't know. I think Shanahan will want to. Um, I think maybe when we get onto this, I'm not sure that we will do it with one of our, one of our higher picks. I think it might well be hopefully that lucky fifth round that we've been able to hit on a few people with uh, in the last few years. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if it's perhaps it, it's just the one if there's someone, and then maybe we try and look for that undrafted uh, player at the at the back end of the um, once the whole draft is over. Let's let's be honest, chaps. There's one name that stands out to every single 49er fan in the running back prospects this season: Frank Gore Jr. Surely it's meant to be, wouldn't it be good? I know it's a nostalgia thing, but you never know. You just never know. He's got the history there. I think he's ranked around about top 300 players. So it could well be 
an undrafted free agent or could well be a late round pick. But obviously, you look down the names. If you don't follow college football super closely, everybody knows the name Frank Gore that follows the 49ers. Frank Gore Jr. What do we reckon, Paul? Would you be a, a fan of that pickup? Oh, 100%. The, the legacy names. You've got McCaffrey's brother. Oh. You've got uh, Tio's son is in the draft. I didn't realise that until I saw a tweet the other day. The thing you've got to remember, Eric, if we don't pick him up and he goes on to become half as good as his dad, you're going to be kicking yourself. Now, the name that you threw me with last week, Eric, was Juice. He's going to be 33 this year. We all know he's vital to this offence. And there's been talk over the last couple of years that we're going to kind of draft his successor. We've had a couple of stabs at undrafted rookies who've come in and we've had high hopes. A name that John Chapman, good friend of the show, seems to be pushing at the moment is Kansas State tight end Ben Sinnott. He's projected to be a mid-round draft pick, but apparently he could have that versatility that could seem employed in the fullback room. But sneakily, he could be classed as a tight end on the roster because when you look at that, those photos I sent you, we're going to jump. We're not going to go to wide receiver yet, Rick. We're going to go to tight end. From what I can see, we've only got two nailed on at the moment. George Kittle, Club 85, obviously. Braden Willis. Now, the mm. Niners typically carry four tight ends on their 53-man roster. Now, the name that Eric's probably going to hit me with is Cameron Latou. Yes, he's still around. Do you have high hopes for making the roster this year, Eric? Or do you think he's missed his chance? No, I think it's going to be tough. Um, and we do like to to draft. And that, what you've just said about an added bonus of having like a versatile player, obviously we all know that our tight ends are all having have they all have to be good run blockers. I mean, most tight ends in the league have to be good run blockers, but especially in our in our offense, uh, we will run the ball a lot. Carl Shanahan is a magician at scheming the run game. Uh, uses the tight ends, uses the fullbacks. Everybody's expected to block. So if we have a tight end that can also sort of cover at fullback, which I think when Juszczyk was injured, we had one of the tight ends. Was it Warner or was it the other one that had to cover uh, in the fullback position? So I do think we'll address uh, address this in the draft. Like you say, Juszczyk's a year older. Obviously, he's restructured his deal. So I do think we'll keep him now for at least the next year, maybe beyond. Uh, as long as he stay help, stay help, stays healthy, that's the main thing. But yeah, Cameron Latu, um, he was not, he wasn't a hit, was he? <laughs> so I think it'd be difficult. But he'll be in with a fight for sure. We carry four, we only have two, so there's space there. There's some someone's um, shirt to go and win. What do you think, Gareth? Well, we drafted two last season, didn't we? Um, yeah. um, this time last year. So, and obviously, like you said, Willis uh, seemed to get a, a few offensive snaps not targets, uh, and obviously some special teams experience. Um, and, and Latu was on IR before the, the season even started, so he didn't even get any sort of chance. Um, whether that's we've seen, you might remember back a few years, Juwan Jennings went on the practice squad for his first season, and now now look, look at where he is. And I think we're doing that with the, the late-round picks. We're looking for talent, we're looking for traits, we're looking for coachability, and we don't mind sitting those guys for a year uh it's whether we haven't seen much from latu about whether he's been able to recover from whatever uh, uh injury he had i'm sure we all um uh, uh wish him well and hope that he's going to be there for for the beginning of training camp i i would suspect that tight end is somewhere we might try and draft um and depending on how the draft falls we may draft was it reasonably high could be third round or so um, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, the fullback is that is a dying out position, isn't it? Um, but we need somebody who can do that job because of that positionless nature of the offense. So it doesn't matter what they're called on the on the roster sheet. Can they do what Juice does? Um, and very few players can. But um, tight end, uh, a big running back, those are the sort of people who who we might be able to get in and learn that position. I think we still have might still have a fullback on the practice squad because we, we have signed a couple of undrafted or, um, yes, I think undrafted sort of fullback type players, haven't we, in the last few years who've hung around on the practice squad for a year or maybe two and then and then been let go. So, Yeah, I tend to, um, because I don't watch other sports, Gareth, I tend to be plugged into all the top content creators 
this time of year. And I, I tend to fall in love with their draft picks. And there's always an unsung hero that they're all banging the drum for. And I mean, the reason I've gone down this way first before wide receivers is there's a couple of veterans. So I've been practicing this name, Gareth, in case we pick him up. CJ Uzuma is still out there, veteran presence. And Robert Tonyan, the two names that we could pick up for a vet minimum that bring that experience. You two mentioned to me off air the Welsh rugby union star, Lewis Rees Zamet, or Rees Lightning, as he's better known, Eric. Now, have you guys been following that? Because I think he could kind of fit in this mix. You could add him I to need... the squad and it doesn't count, I believe. Yeah. Is that right? I need to defer to, to someone who's much closer to Wales than I am in Gareth on this one. I don't, I don't have much of a clue when it comes to rugby, unfortunately. But it's, we have got history, though. We had um, the Australian rugby player, didn't we, for a while? I can't remember his name now. Um, that played. Obviously, we got Wisnowski as well. Is it Jared? Jared Hain, I think he, he returned. Jared Hain, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. So we do have game. history. Yeah, but uh, Gareth, what do you think? Are you, have you got your eye on the rugby, well, rugby it's, stuff? It's been coming around because obviously it's quite high profile. He was certainly high profile in Wales. He's one of the uh, sort of, when I say up and coming talents, but, uh, you know, he'd been with the team three years maybe by the, by by this sort of time. Played in the World Cup, obviously played in Six Nations matches, uh, played for, for his club Gloucester for, uh, yeah, since he was 18, I think, possibly possibly even 17, but certainly uh, 18. Bit of a surprise. Um, and obviously this this occasionally happens when we see uh, particularly British rugby players go and try their luck in the, in the player pathway. And I think everybody realises it's, it's incredibly tough for those guys to learn a game to the standard of people who've played, uh, you know, toddlers, little league, whatever it is. Then they've played high school. And high school, of course, is, is the talent factory where you get picked up for college, which is a talent factory to get picked up to the NFL. And you've been playing the game at that level for, you know, three quarters of your, of your life by the time you go to the draft. It's going to be tough for people to, for anyone outside to come and do that. But I think I, I, I can see this very tough and a lot of people have said no chance. Um, I would like to make a case for, for him, for, for this player in particular. I don't know the other player pathways. Um, and that's that's as a role on special teams, uh, because yeah, he's set up as a as a receiver or a running back. Um, but I think we know difficult on the running back. You've got to be able to pick up the blitzes. You've got to understand how the game's unfolding. You've got to find the space. You've got to know where to go. You, you've got to know when to stay and when to when to go out. Um, and obviously the receiver root tree and the complexities of that. And and that's a lot for somebody to take on. But there's a couple of traits for rugby. First, obviously, if you're a gunner. He's fast. Louis Riesam is fast and he can make a tackle because that is absolutely essential in international quality, uh, international level rugby. Doesn't matter what position you're playing. You've got to be able to make a tackle. Um, and I'm not belittling special teams, but that that's a simpler, less structured part of the game. Um, if you can get down there quickly and you can nail a tackle, which you can do, then that's there, there's a role there. Um, kick returner as well. In rugby, people think about the passing the ball, but there's a lot of kicking in modern rugby. And you're going up in, and jumping often to collect a ball, knowing you are going to get absolutely whacked as soon as you land. And again, that's exactly what you're looking for in the punt and kick returner. So I, uh, obviously, as a as a fan of him, as a, as a Welsh rugby player, I don't see why he wouldn't take a punt on a guy like that um, and see what you can do on special teams. Um, and then try and see what you can do in terms of learning the game. Some of these guys do hang around on the practice squad from the from the player pathway for a few years, um, and that's probably what they need. But he is young, um, and there is there is talent there. He is he is strong. He's clearly got that professional ethic because he's been a professional athlete since he was eighteen. All of that it's it's a good start in the NFL, but yeah, incredibly tough to make it anywhere outside of special teams. But not impossible. Um, I didn't realise are... you. Uh, I didn't realise you doubled as a rugby agent, Gareth. That was a clearly a yeah. of pitch there. <laughs> what, uh, what did I tell you, Eric? This man yeah. knows his stuff. We just don't let him uh, talk on the podcast. That's the problem. 
<laughs> I'm absolutely on board, all on board the Reese Lightning hype train after that pitch. Come on, that was good it, he, he went he went to a couple of teams, and I mean this is not to devalue it, but I think the couple of teams there was the Jets and I can't remember which the other team were, but they were pretty sure that they were both teams with the UK marketing rights. Um I think he went these to the sort Jets. Of things, he definitely went to the Jets. I've seen matter. rumors that the Chiefs were looking at him. Um he ran a 4.540 at the pathway pro day and you said something earlier gareth now if nadji was with us nadji used to be our go-to because he played contact i dabbled with a bit of flag football in the last 18 months i'm not comparing myself to an international rugby star but you're right learning the nuances of the game i mean even doing these podcasts i'd go to training and there'd be a wrinkle in the playbook and the head coach would be like you haven't run that route properly or i'd say something and i'd be like i don't understand what you mean just tell me where to run and I'll run. Now, that was amateur flag football. When you get in, into the pros in the big boy league, and you're right, Gareth, it's dog eat dog. I've seen the percentages. Is it something like the top 1% of college mm -hmm. athletes go on to the NFL? And you've got someone coming across. I don't know if you chaps have been watching Gladiators on a Saturday night. It's our new family show on a Saturday. Apollo used to be the tight end on the international pathway. I believe he was at the Falcons. It really angers me, Gareth, that they keep calling him an NFL star. I keep shouting at the telly. He didn't <laughs> start in the NFL. He didn't play in the NFL. And Tracy's like, calm down. I'm like, it's good that he had that exposure. But it just goes to show you, I think he was another one with a good rugby background. He's obviously bounced around the league for a couple of years, given up on that dream of the NFL. I hope that Reese right, Lightning, as they call him, does make it to a squad, given the fact that the game is growing on this side of the pond. It would be awesome to have one of our road as a poster boy, but I do think the odds are stacked against him. True, but I think there's there's obviously kicker and punter is a is a bit of a well trodden route for uh, for people who haven't necessarily come through the through the college system. Um, and I think you know we do have uh, some British born players. F.A. Barder, I think is still around, isn't he? Possibly still at Washington. Um, not necessarily a star, but this must be his fourth or fifth. Um, season on an NFL roster that's success, that's pretty good yeah, success. It's great. It's great I think see. it's it, it's obviously tougher for the offensive skill position players, I think, than the not again, not devaluing them. But obviously, the pass for us, you pin your ears back and go after the quarterback. Um, uh, there's there seems to be a simplicity about it in terms of, of tactics, your, your technique, your strength, your conditioning, all of that is hugely important. But to me, it doesn't, it's not quite the same as trying to learn a route tree for a receiver yeah, so or, or or for how a, how a running back has to read the game of of, of do I stay here and, and pass block or do I try and sneak out? And if I sneak out, where do I go? Because I need to understand where everybody else is going to go so I don't run into my own tight end. So, And I'm after the after the season, there's one phase of the game that we really need to improve in their special teams. Special teams. So I think yeah. you're onto something there, Gareth, with the special teams angle. It's a bit more simplified, but either way, it's a it's an area that the team needs to address for sure. Well, special hold teams. that thought, Eric. We'll jump ahead because I love this on the live. So the special teams at the moment is made up of three players. Everybody's <laughs> favourite, Tabor Pepper. Yeah. Legend, that is Jake Moody. And yes. Gareth's favourite player of all time, mm. Mitch Wisnowski. Because Lee Gowland says it's a wasted draft pick. What does he know, Gareth? But at the moment, <laughs> those trio are locked in for another season. But we haven't got a kick returner. We haven't got a punt mm. returner, so maybe there is a role there. I mean, Collins jumped in there, but uh, Alfredo is our international player at the moment, but he's not sure if he remains. And I agree, he has been on the squad for a few years, breaking into that Mexico market. I can see how they've utilised that. I don't think the Niners would take the Welsh lad just for that reason, but like you said, there's a gap at the moment in that special teams. Is it something you're worried about, Eric, the special teams at the moment? After that Super Bowl, I don't know how you can't be. <laughs> <laughs> we we obviously had a little bit of a a challenge on special teams. And I think even, even before the Super Bowl, throughout the season, we had some questionable uh, special teams play at times. It wasn't, if you look at statistically, we were like one of the top offences, a little bit less on defence last year. And special teams, we were way down. So it's something we need to improve. And we obviously have some of the good foundations there. I think Wisnowski played really well last year. Mm -hmm. Moody, I think, for a debut season was was really good. I think he 
now pretty much every extra point, didn't he, up until one particular one. Um, and so, yeah, it just depends on all the other players that we put in and around him. We'll see Chris Conley's coming back. So yeah. he's likely to get that. special teams reps yeah. and probably some of the backup linebackers, etc. be on special teams. We obviously have the 49er faithful favourite, Sammy Womack. <laughs> if he makes the roster, he's going to probably play special teams. Uh, fingers crossed. You never know if he will, right? But if he's there, then he's likely to. So we'll we'll see what happens, but um, I, yeah, it's definitely some something I would like to see us focus a bit on because we did struggle at times. So what you're saying, Eric, to, if we're going to keep a player on the roster for marketing reasons, Sammy Warmack has to be that man because Lee Goland has spent a shed load of money <laughs> on merchandise and, now, and no more number changes either. <laughs> yeah. Now, Gareth, you know that I love a good start. Now, next mm-hmm. gen have got a new start for this year. So apparently they're going to judge punters on field position over expectation. Don't know how it's calculated, but based on the new stat last year, Mitch didn't just have a good season, chaps. He delivered 190 yards of field position over expectation, which would have ranked him third in the league. Not bad for your punter drafted. What round did we draft him again? Fourth, I think. It was fourth. Fourth, yeah. Yeah. No, oh, very good, very good. He was but, absolutely robbed of one of the greatest fakes of all time as well. Yeah, totally, totally, and was totally. absolutely robbed by so, the silliness of Ronnie Bell, unfortunately, because that was absolutely brilliant. He saw that the defence was sleeping and he nearly had a brilliant run. I'd love to see him do that again. Yeah. So Justin is checking in from across the pond. So Justin Gareth is the... 49 Faithful UK champion at the moment. He is shouting us out on John Chapman, Jason Aponte. And he managed to, to get Thank John you. to shout us out last night. So he's put he's at work, but he's going to check back in later. Have a great show. So we do it appreciate is. the love, Justin. Keep yeah. flying that flag. No pun intended. And it's always good to see. So where do we go next, chaps? I've jumped I'm, around. I'm... I'm worried. I'm worried about special teams. I think I, I've enjoyed having Ray Ray McLeod because um, I haven't sat there hiding behind the sofa, peering out every time we, you know, our defense is great, like great. We've got them off the field, and then I'm like, oh my god, we're going to have to field the punt down in close to our own end zone. And for the previous few years, that's always given me um, the that's the roller coaster kicking off at one thirty in the morning fielding punts. Um, and fair enough, Ray Ray never burst one out and, and got that TD, but he was pretty reliable. Um, and that is a worry at the moment because somebody's got to do it. You can't just ignore that part of the game. And at the moment we haven't got anyone. And do we really want to try and pick up a late round rookie and stick them in um, for punt returns? I'm not hundred percent sure that I'm comfortable with that either. And, so. and I don't want to see Debo there either. No. Too much I mean, with to be, injury risk. To be fair, Gareth, you're right. The last time we didn't have a true candidate for that role was back in 2021. And that was a disastrous year for the return units. And we always joke on at the start of every year, one of our bold predictions is a kick return is going to go to the house. And it's a part of the game you, you want to see. Um, I think James is pushing for Jerry Rice's son to be in the mix. be pretty epic, wouldn't it, if he became yeah. a, a kick returner, punt returner for the Niners. At this stage, I don't know too much about the potential of these names. I'm just throwing them out there. We are in draft season, everybody. We are going to kind of start doing our deep dive. Before we move on, I do really need to shout out Sarah is putting together a Zoom call for the draft night. So we tend to have a watch along on Zoom. If it is something you're interested, do keep an eye out on our socials. It's a late so night. It is a late night. Um, Pick 31. <laughs> not sure whether I'll be partaking. I don't know. It's Kaylee's birthday weekend that weekend. But the fact that we've got a first round pick, and you've got to remember, Gareth, the last time we stayed up late was when we had a certain number three pick and mm. the different Zoom rooms were on different time scales. <laughs> so it does make for good comedy value. But do keep an eye out on socials. Sarah is a part of the admin team. She is running with that one so big shout out to sarah for that so where do we go next chaps we've done special teams should we look at wide receiver room do you need to oh, talk yeah. about wide receivers don't we after probably a bit of news maybe today. but we were we were just hearing from jimmy right brendan rice he was pushing for brendan rice who's a receiver so another one with former connections and i think he's ranked in the top 150 so you never know about brendan rice but i think we definitely need to talk about a certain Brendan Ayuk. We touched on it last week, Paul. 
But what do you think about some of the news today from John Lynch and from Brendan Ayuk himself? I'm feeling quite smug because similar to the Tebo situation a couple of years ago, I was telling people not to worry. We said last week, Gareth, there's some unofficial deadlines that you can kind of go by. So if Ayuk is to get traded, it's got to be done by the draft. There's no point giving him to a team during the draft for a pick next year. So Ayuk can go and be an immediate help to a team. And then we've got no compensation. But John Lynch has come out. I don't know whether he needed to. It's a bit unusual that Lynch tends to come out. To, and they tend to go radio silent for me until June in training camp. But the fact that they've come out today and they've said, look, we've got no intention of trade name. Obviously, the two parties are in discussion. Now, I, I hadn't seen his Instagram post because I've been away from social media today. What did you make of the Instagram post, Gareth? Or do you just think social media? I'm not interested in this no, time no, of year about social nice, media. Nicely done with the emojis. I think uh, a lot of this, there's it's this pantomime of posturing that they go through at this time of year. The, the, the team offers a low ball money. The, the diva player uh, throws their toys out of the pram. They, there's a bit of silence in between. And it's 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 a game. They they It just seems to play out every single year. Um, I think we'll get the deal done with Ayuk. Um, I think we've we've probably been able to, to budget for it. Um, we know, I think this may well be the last season that we've got all of these star players who are earning a lot of money together. Um, and I think we can do it because obviously we're, we're due to pay Ayuk 14 million this year anyway. I'm sure we can work out a deal. And as happens with the other ones, you can work out contracts with players. You don't actually have to pay them at some point. You can you can do something else. You can trade them. Um, or as you saw with with like Armstead um, and the value of his contract, you, you can cut players. Um, not that we want to see people go, but that's, that's not a reason not to sign them. Um, I think Ike's done himself well because he's clearly built that relationship with Purdy. He's seen the writing on the wall there and said, okay, Purdy's the man here. Um, the way that I make myself even more valuable is making sure I'm Purdy's go-to guy. Um, and, you know, from the from the days in the doghouse to being our 1,300-yard receiver, I think he's earned the money. He's not perhaps the flashy and the top name as some of the other players, um, but he's every bit as good, I think, as any any other receiver you might name, want to name. So where else do we get another one? I think there's a lot available in this year's draft. I think we can scare most teams off by by the the round first round pick that we'd want for him, um, and then basically saying, look, there's there's no no one out there loves you enough to trade for you. Um, we did. We drafted you. Um, and we'll pay you. We'll pay you the top weight of the of the money. Um, and we'll just go through this, and he'll he'll scrub the team off his Instagram Instagram, and it'll all go quiet, and it'll be yeah yeah same that we always do. Um, and then he'll sign, and it'll all be forgotten about a week or two later. Yeah, it's yeah. a negotiation tactic. We talked about this last week. It's exactly what happened to Debo a few years ago. I did see an interesting stat that although he was top receiver, Ayuk, he only had 105 targets. I think it was which is way down compared to some of the other top receivers. So I think there's potential for him to be even better with more targets. Obviously, that's you don't we don't share the love in our offense, right? We don't everyone, need everyone have, wants to eat. We don't need to have one player that gets all the targets in our offense. We can spread the spread the ball around. But it's a negotiation tactic. Uh, what I did say last week and I'll say it again, I hope he has a, a faster start to the season and doesn't do what Debo did and Bosa did, which is to sign the big money deal and then have a bit of a slow start to the season. That would be my only concern. What do you reckon, Paul? Yeah, I mean, we, we said that last week when Debo signed Gareth, we were all a bit disappointed that he started the season slow. I think what surprises me with these players, you go back and you look at when Kittle signed, when Warner signed, when Debo signed. Again, I'm not an expert in the salary cap. I go up the likes of Jason Hurley on Twitter and see what he posts. Now, Eric Armstead's money doesn't hit the savings pot, Gareth, until June the 1st. And another reason why I'm confident is people saying, how can you afford to keep Debo and Ayuk? I'd put a tweet out, Eric, saying, why not keep both a couple of days ago? And someone was like, you can't keep both, Paul. I was like, well, actually, you can, because his current cap hit is $14.1 million. You know we sign him to an extension. That's going down to vet minimum with a backdated sign and bonus and all the rest of it. And you're right, Gareth, we're kicking the can down the road at some point. 
difficult decisions need to be made. But when you've got your whole quarterback room making $5 million, you can't afford. Um, I think John Lynch has come out because one thing that did make me chuckle is I don't know if you've seen the picture of Lynch and Mike Tomlin stood next to get watching some draft prospect. And that's on the back of, I think, are you could tag Tomlin in a tweet? Mm. Just goes to show how social media works. And apparently Lynch's comments were, Mike coached me in Tampa Bay. We're very close. Mike came up to him and said, bro, what's going on with Ayuk? And John Lynch said, nothing. We've no plans to trade him. Now, I don't believe for a single second, chaps, that phone calls have been made behind closed doors and the gauge and interest. But what I will say, a fans are worried, go back to the year Debo was posturing, wanting his contract. You can always tell what a team is going to do ahead of the draft. And we didn't work out any of the top receivers that year. We weren't basically engaging in any of the talk. It was a case of, like you said, Gareth Wright, give us your first round pick and some more. And nobody came to the table with that. So I believe history repeats itself this year. There's a lot of posturing. I think the draft will come and go. I get his new contract. Everything gets added back on social media. And then we will have four of what I believe our five receivers signed. So we talked last week, Gareth, about the receivers. So I believe at the moment we've got Ayuk, Samuel, Jennings, Chris Conley. Now, outside of that, we've got Ronnie Bell. Please change your number, Ronnie, if you're staying. Uh, Danny Gray. Danny Gray, Tim yeah. Martin. So, I mean, Gray is still around. Obviously, he's re- he was injured last year, but that wide receiver room's looking a bit sparse for me, chaps. I think it'll be it will be hitting the draft, not not necessarily early, but um, I think we will we will go go uh, wide receiver at some point in the draft. I think Ronnie Bell is potentially because he's only done his rookie season, um, you know, and and fair enough, he was he was a healthy scratch towards the back end of the season, but we've we saw that with some other players as well that they they just run out of, of juice. But it's a long, hard season. I remember we we asked the players. I know it's a hard game. It's, it's no point saying that some teams are soft. But I think, particularly on our offense, it's even harder on the players because our offensive players are always trying to find a linebacker to go and smack as hard as they can in the blocking. And not every team plays offense that way for the skill position players. So I'm, I'm hoping he just ran out of juice. I think Gray at this point of the season of his career, it will be what third year. I think he's probably he's got an uphill battle um, uh, to to make the team, um, unless of course he's been doing a lot of um, catching high balls for kick return in the off seasons. Then maybe that's a chance that could save him. But um, but can't see can't see that. I can I can see Bell having another year, but I think Gray, since he's done nothing in two years um, and hasn't even been getting any any kind of um, uh, you know suiting up. Let alone targets, because um, you know Ronnie Bell had uh, what did he have something like three catches and two touchdowns, so um, he, he showed he showed a little bit and he clearly earned something there. But I, I think he'll be back. But I think we will we will go back to wide receiver, and I wouldn't be surprised if if we pick up another um, a veteran again, not necessarily a big name, one of those guys who's been been around the league, and you never know because always at the back end of the um, uh, training camp. You always get a few surprise people getting cut off the teams that they've been with, and they're not necessarily talking about the big, the big, big names. But you get a few useful players who, who suddenly a rookie has done well. They want to trim a little bit off the cap to have a little bit of money to play with during the season, um, and you get a decent veteran shed um, at the end of uh, August. So I can well see us going shopping then as well. So we, me and Eric talked a lot about the defensive line and the linebackers last week. So I don't think we need to go over that again. But obviously getting you on, Gareth. So we've invested a lot of money in a defensive line again. Are you happy with what we did? I know you said at the start about your free agency, but I'm guessing defensive line. Can you see us taking someone in the first round? For the... <laughs> Always. Not not in the first round. I think, I think that right tackle, uh, maybe even right guard spot, I think offensive line is, is greater need. Uh, I definitely think we will um, pick up at least one or two late round, fifth, sixth um, defensive players um, and have a have a little project player um, for Chris to work on. Um, 
other than that, I'm pretty pleased. I'm, I'm surprised we signed um, as many linebackers as we did, given that we again we drafted two last year. Though obviously Robert Beal is perhaps a bit more uh, specialist edge, really the outside linebacker, rather than the way we've had Greenlaw um, uh, and Warner uh, play. So I think there there's something there. Um, I think we've still got a, a smattering of defensive guys on the practice squad. So some of them tucked away for a year. Some of these guys, it might suddenly click for them. Um, they put on a bit of muscle, put on a bit of speed, and suddenly they're they're doing well in training camp, catching eyes. It's possible. Um, but I, I personally think the O-line um, has been underinvested in for some time. Uh, and I think with the signings we've done in free agency, the defensive line is not our priority. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe talking about what we do with the first round pick um, is is somewhere to go before we wrap up. Be interesting. Yeah. Before um, I get Eric's thoughts, do you not think some of the linebackers we've picked up are more to improve the special teams unit? So, for example, Turner, he blocked a punt with the Cardinals in 2020. He's part of the attempted solution, I believe. Like, like we've done before, we've brought a couple of linebackers in, we've stashed them on the special teams unit. I mean, you both said it's an area that you worried about. I think we were ranked 25 in DV or A last year. So anything we can add to that special teams unit, I'm quite happy. But uh, what do you reckon, Eric? Do you think that's where the focus and a lot of the attention on for some of these pieces in free agency? Yeah, I think we, we talked a bit last week, didn't we, about the offensive line. It's actually the same unit pretty much that finished the season. So... Although it's been underinvested in, we still have a similar unit that helped us get to a Super Bowl in an offense that was playing really well for most of the season. So I actually think a little bit different to Gareth. I think the D line is more important now. We've lost Armstead to make sure we got right. And I, I was watching the uh, mock draft of John Chapman yesterday, and he I think drafted a, a D lineman or a couple of defensive and a couple of O linemen as well. <laughs> So I could well see that happening. I, I think it's a possibility. Um, and I think the D-line, the D-line for me is more important just because we lost Armstead. I think we need to, there's no one player that's going to replace him. We need to f fill the gaps with a few different players and and good coaching and good schemes. Um, but we'll see how it goes. I think the difficulty, Gareth, with uh, offensive line, I know when we did the pod a couple of weeks ago, uh, Nadji and Lee laughed when I was like saying, I'd love to see Robert Hunt come over from the Dolphins, but the fact that he wanted, what, 100 million, 150 million. And because offensive linemen are so highly sought, going down for free agency, me and Eric said last week, wasn't an option we've got with this where this uh, team is constructed. I mean, the unit finished 22nd in ESPN's plus, pass block win rate in 2023. So I think Purdy got them out of trouble a lot with his mobility. Right. I'm going to disagree with you, Eric. I'm going to go with Gareth. I'm going to disagree with Chapman as well. I would like to see us focus on the offensive line in this draft. Um, I know Brad Graham is the offensive lineman, content creator that I go and watch. And he's banging the drum for us getting an offensive lineman in the first round. But Gareth, you said before we finish off, let's talk about which position we're going to draft. I honestly don't know, buddy. I couldn't tell you as it stands right now what position we're looking at, unless you've got some hidden well, insight that I don't know about. No, but I think... I think we should we should go offensive line, but I think offensive line is 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 one of the more difficult positions to evaluate. I think you're you know you're you're looking for individual traits, and I think you can um, you can be flattered if you're uh, suppose you're a college team and you've, your your left tackle is good, and your right tackle suddenly ends up being that you're like your third choice right tackle, perhaps for for that college. Um, every defensive coordinator is going to attack that position, so suddenly you say the left tackle didn't give up any sacks the right tackle gave up 10 sacks it sounds terrible doesn't it but suddenly you get them to the nfl and the left tackle he hasn't been bothered for the last year he's been facing teams fourth and fifth pass rushes um so he's looked great whereas the guy who's on the right side is suddenly up to nfl speed because he's been getting battered by the best pass rushers uh, available and i just think it's it's difficult to evaluate and i think the position we're drafting at is a really tricky position we've seen the patriots had this kind of pick for years didn't they pick 31 pick 32 they all traded back i i think it's the if you're unless you're building a team and you're looking for those five-year contracts 
we either trade up from this position and get a much better choice or we trade down from it and just accept we'll see who falls to us. I think we're in a in the sticky position that it's a first round pick and it's very, very difficult to evaluate who we might get there. If it's pick 20, I'm pretty sure we know that we'll be able to get a good tackle prospect. Will they be there at pick 31? And if not, maybe trade back and it's less of a risk using that second round pick. Um, um, Because basically you can pick, if you trade back from 31 and pick up a, a second and a fifth or whatever, you've got two chances. You've doubled your chances. Whereas, yeah, I think it's a back end of the first round, I think, is, is one of the worst places to, to be picking just because it's it's so difficult to get the value there. Yeah, I agree with that, Gareth. I think the other thing I would say on the draft is that every single year I try and predict what John Lynch and Carl Shanahan are going to do, and every single year I get it wrong. <laughs> I just get it wrong every year. They seem to drop some sort of uh, unexpected move like drafting a kicker in the third round, like drafting a puncher in the fourth round, like trading up for Trey Lance. You know, they just seem to have a history of doing something a little bit unexpected. So we could sit here and analyze, and obviously this is part of the fun to analyze, but you also can't count against them doing some sort of move, maybe in line with what Gareth was just talking about, either moving up to the top 20 or moving back down into the second. You just never know. Uh, well, I think either we, way, it'd be exciting. Yeah, we, we've said there are some spaces to be won, but I think we were all surprised we took all 11 picks last year. And I think it's really, really tough for any of these late round guys to break into the team. And part yeah. of me does think I'm quite happy to sacrifice a few of those to move up um, and get, get what we want in, in the first round, given that we're in that real sort of twilight zone of the first round where basically the players you're picking could either be at the end of the first round or they could be at the top end of the third. They're, they're in that kind of, to me, it's a tier of players who are, who are outside the real nailed on first round prospects. And then you're in a bit of, it's a first round pick and you really, some guys fall from there and you could have picked them up at the back end of the second. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see. John's got a plan. All faith in John. He's yeah. done well, I think, in the draft. So we'll take yes. up for Debo, Gareth. I mean, Debo, we had him as a first round projection back in the day and we managed to get him in the second. I'm just smiling because if we trade up, Eric, it'll be epic for Sarah and a Zoom call. But can you imagine? Everyone's plugged in. It's stupid o'clock in the UK and it's the 49ers <laughs> are on the clock. Oh, the 49ers have traded back <laughs> and it's like. <laughs> Come back tomorrow. But but all jokes aside, we have shown that we can be quite aggressive. We have shown that we can. Like you said, Gareth, some drafts, we've used all of them. I think we went on record last year and said, there's no way, Eric, that the team are using all of them. And they mm. did. Now, we do like to have a bit of fun close to draft day. We will be doing our live mock draft, which we do on the pod. We were very excited last year that we took Jake Moody. Now, I think we took him in the seventh round and we were claiming that we knew what the team were doing. We didn't have him... <laughs> That high up, but I will say, if you do want to get on the PFF mock draft simulator, that's a good tool to use at the moment. Also, we always shout out the content creators, like you said, Eric John Chapman dropped the show last night. Wayne Breezy, Jason Ponte, all the big hitters, they're dropping all their draft boards. I think Steph Sanchez has a, a Google spreadsheet with every player that the Niners have spoken to in free agency in the draft. That's always a good read. And likewise, if you want to hit us up with some of your draft crushes so we can do a little bit more of a deep dive, we will be back next week with the live. We haven't selected the topic yet. I'm trying to be a bit fluid, Gareth, with the news that's breaking. I can say I've secured the guest for the 10th of April. So the fact checker himself, Mr. Alex Simpson (laughs) of Let's Talk Sports, will be joining me on April the 10th. His good friend Gary Thorpe has been having lots of fun winding Alec up. Because I'll put it out there, Alec gave a bold prediction at this time last year that the Chiefs wouldn't make the playoffs. So I cannot <laughs> wait to see what bold prediction he brings in oh, two weeks' okay? time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wished he was right, Gareth. That's mm. how I wished it, it was. But uh, So does everybody in the NFL, I think. Yeah. Too so true. anything else, chaps, that you want to touch upon? Because we're getting close to the hour. I always try to keep the lives to an hour. It's difficult my, with Gowland, but... Uh, my final point. Point. Yeah, I just have one final point around this whole draft thing. We are not in a rebuild. We're only mm-hmm. supplementing all the great players. We have an amazing core. 
we're supplementing that with the top top few percent that's going to get us over the line that's what we're doing so it's exciting but all of our best players are still there pretty much armstead is obviously a loss but if you look at the rest of the team all of our stars are still there for another year brock purdy's gonna have a full pre-season which is gonna make that little bit of difference and obviously the quest for six starts right now what do we reckon gareth yeah totally um i think uh, i can't remember if i mentioned it but lynch has has had this uh a knack of always putting us ready for the draft without a glaring need meaning that we've got flexibility because i think that's the worst thing going into the draft without the leverage um you, you're either you're either desperate to make a deal or you're desperate for a player as soon as two or three of that position come off the board you panic and you reach um and we see it every single year gms do it and i think uh, lynch helps himself by making sure he doesn't put himself in that position um, and I think we've done that. The only thing I was going to say, I'm just going to uh, leave this and then one, um, and that's hip drop. Maybe we'll talk about that at another time. That's that's going to be the um, the thing for the first few games of the season, um, as it always is in the rule change. We talk about it, then the players adapt, and it's forgotten by about week six. But um, I look forward to uh, to the hip drop I was weeks one to, to five. I was going to put some footage of that of Gareth, but Ty Alston, our good friend, was doing a show last week with Melissa, and they were looking at some of the top players from last year, and his stream got cancelled midstream. Now, he doesn't know whether it was a copyright issue, whether it was an internet issue, but it just seemed coincidental that he was shown footage. Now, I know copyright is a thing, and I'm, I'm not trying to say Ty did anything wrong. But I know Nadji has talked about maybe he's talking through players, and when I saw that rule change, I thought, how could we touch upon that without showing video footage? So I'm going to do some research on that. But it's not something that I fully knew, but it is possibly something that we might start next week's show with. But what I wanted to ask you two before we finished off. So we're at this weird start of the season where jerseys are dropping, players are changing names, the draft caps have dropped today. So I was at the Metro Centre with Tracy and Jasmine, because she's on her Easter holidays. We were in the middle of playing a round of mini golf, which I have warned both of them. I was shouting out chaps because I won. I scored 49. <laughs> so I can't not mention that I scored 49. And Connor Ryan texted me, have you seen the new draft caps? Now, I am partial to a cap or two, which Tracy knows. Um, this is a draft cap that uh, Lee and Nadji brought me back from Vegas a couple of years ago. I'm not a fan of the new ones. I don't know if you've saw no, them. Not really. Very nondescript, aren't they? Yeah. They, they've had an off year, which is good because it'll save my bank balance. <laughs> so, a cheeky plug. If you are in the northeast of England, I was in the Metro Centre today and they've got a lids. Now, the NFL caps and merchandise range was a lot better than I've expected. They've also got that sewing machine where they can get like signatures on the side. And like what we saw at lids in America, and I'm not going to lie, there was a plain red SF 49ers cap that was just nondescript until I picked it up and I saw the Brock Purdy signature on the side. And I was like, <laughs> no, no, be good. Be good. I thought you were going to say P Hope like that on the <laughs> side. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's just, it's nice to see that kind of thing becoming more of a thing. And I saw more NFL hats, jerseys walking around the Metro Centre. And yeah, I showed Tracy the new Debo Samuel jersey? Because I'll be honest, lads, I wasn't keen on the number one. But when I showed it to Tracy Gareth, she said, oh, I think that looks quite nice. So that's the permission that, that's it. That's that's the next jersey I'm buying. Christmas sorted wanted, ball. Yeah. I just wanted <laughs> I to in, ask. Yeah, I was just going to say, I was in Westfields in London um, on at the weekend and I went into the lids there and they had quite a, they had a couple of 49ers hats and they also had a Montana jersey. So I think the selection is getting better outside of the usual suspects i think the selection is getting better across and obviously as we keep growing popularity that's the thing that talks isn't it if people are going to buy the merch they'll supply it so hopefully it'll keep getting better and better and talking of popularity eric see you're already well versed in the rabbit holes that we go down the road to 2000 subs starts here we are going to keep banging this drum we've hit the thousand subs on youtube we will be doing the giveaway competition for the Joe Staley bobblehead. It's just obviously Lee has taken some time away at the moment. So we're just trying to get our heads around how best to give that away. But we're at a thousand. 
please do like, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your family members. It does mean the world to us. We hit 50,000 downloads on the pod, which I don't know, Gareth, about you. I'm still blown away that we've managed to hit <laughs> that wonderful number. So do stay That's tuned. A, it's a lot of burner phones our mums are using up, isn't it? <laughs> no, I, lo I love listening to the pods. I'm a big fan. So a lot of those downloads are me, chaps. You do a great job. I absolutely love listening to the pods. We will be back. The awesome foursome. Um, Gareth and Nad uh, sorry, Lee and Nadji have just taken some family time at the moment. I think, chaps, we've covered everything that we needed to cover this week. We have. We, we will have. be back next week. I will confirm the time and date on the social media, as I always do. But thank you both for joining me, Gareth. Thank you. It's nice to, yeah, good hosting. Where have you learned that from? <laughs> well, what can I say? I learned from the best. And you weren't that unruly. Maybe I need to give yeah, you some lessons on being unruly. And Eric? It's uh, no Lee. He's the bad influence, I think. <laughs> We can say that when he's not here. And Eric, second appearance, it certainly yeah, will be Yeah, thanks for having me. I absolutely love it. Love everybody watching as well. Like the comments keep coming through. It's amazing to see. So thanks everybody for watching. Hopefully I'll be invited back on at some stage. 100% buddy. Well, all that is left for me to say is stay safe and go Niners. Go Niners. We love the San Francisco 49ers deep in the heart. Like Joe Montana in the corner, deep heart. Garrison